insists on embodiment. Right, yes. Hello. In my view, intelligence is, is a much more general term. Uh, the problem with the word thinking is that, uh, is that it, it means something very specific. And I think, it, I think what it means goes right back to Descartes, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So, um, really, thinking implies a reflective or self-aware reflective thought. So the kind of thinking that, that you and I are doing right now, that, that, that is in the front of our minds, that we're, that we're aware of. So uh, clearly there is, there's a vast amount of, of, of cognitive processing going on in, in animal brains and, and human brains. But I guess conventionally and you know, linguistically and, and so on, we, we don't regard all of that stuff as thinking. So in other words, I think we, we reserve the, the word thinking for the bits of, of that cognitive stuff that you're attending to, you know, that you and I are attending to. Um, the stuff we're not attending to is unconscious um, and, and I think conventionally we don't think of that as, as thoughts. Now, you know, if you go along with that view, a reasonable view then um, as a roboticist you have to be interested in the whole of that cognitive processing not just the bits that that are as it were consciously attended to I mean not least because because we don't have any conscious robots so therefore we don't have any robots right now uh, that are able to in a meaningful sense consciously attend to to cognitive processes and therefore are thinking so the word intelligence is much more useful because I think it, it's a coverall term. Uh, of course, intelligence isn't just cognition, and again, that's important to, to stress. Um, intelligence, in my view, is the emergent property of the cognitive processes in the robot or the animal, and the interaction of those cognitive processes with the animal or human's body and with the environment. So when you have a physical body that's doing stuff, interacting with the environment, and you have cognitive processes that are mediating those actions, that are controlling those actions, then the emergent outcome of all of that is, in my view, intelligence. The key word here is learning. So the, the vast majority of robots in the world, including in research labs, do not learn. In other words, they, you know, the, the, the intelligence, in the way I defined it a, a few minutes ago, uh, is, as you say, hard-coded by the programmer, by the designer. Uh, and that includes the designer of the hardware as well as the designer of the software. Um, a small number of robots do have the ability to learn or they're, they're, they're programmed with the ability to learn and as you say um, often if you just observe the robot interacting in you know doing its thing in the lab or in the world it's hard to tell you know whether a robot um, this is a robot that's been hand programmed or has learned often in fact Often it, the, the, the robots that have learned stuff are paradoxically much simpler or doing much simpler things. So, you know, we're used to robots that, that, that appear to do extraordinarily complicated things like, like warehouse robots that are running around fetching stuff from shelves and bringing it to a collection point and so on. There's no learning going on there. Yet, when you look at, at, at the, the little... A now robot learning how to, to stack little cubes like a child playing with, 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 with blocks. What you're seeing is not a, an especially advanced um, intelligence, at least not in human terms, 
but it's still extraordinarily difficult to do because in the case of the, the warehouse robot, the programmer has designed the whole of the behavior of the robot. Whereas in the case of the now robot that, that's, that's learning how to, to stack blocks, the designer has to, had to code the process of learning and that's much more difficult. So the, the, the designer's not coded block stacking, but the process of learning how to do block stacking. That's, you know, that's really a, a significantly more difficult thing to do. But you're quite right that, that you know, someone just looking at robots would find it hard to, to know, you know which, as it were, have been hand-coded and which have learned to do what they're doing. There are you know, several methods or approaches to, to machine learning or robot learning. And certainly, you know, probably the, the, the longest established, which is called reinforcement learning, is basically a, a kind of computational model of Skinnerian learning. You know, the idea of, of, of an animal, um, pigeons famously, um, that, that um, are conditioned to learn certain behaviours in response to certain stimuli. Um, you know, that, that fundamentally, I think, is, is what um, uh, roboticists try and achieve when they, when they build a reinforcement learning system. So, as the name implies, um, uh, some, you try out different behaviours. The ones that, that are um, the most successful get some reward. In other words, they're reinforced and, and you're, you, you therefore um, you're more likely to, to try those successful behaviours the next time. But of course there are, there are other kinds of learning apart from reinforcement learning and again we, we try and, and, and kind of emulate those kinds of learning. So another kind of learning uh, is imitation, learning by imitation. Um, and uh, so in robotics you know, there, there are people who uh, code robots, write robot uh, software, uh, so that the robots can learn from observing either a, another human or sometimes another robot. So, uh, and that's that's called uh, robot programming by demonstration. So that's another kind of learning, uh, learning by imitation. A third type of learning which I think is particularly interesting, is, is actually learning through a process of artificial evolution. So sometimes it's called um, evolutionary learning. Essentially what you're doing is, is, is taking a, a, a Darwinian-inspired approach, which is called a genetic algorithm, uh, to evolve new versions of your own brain, or you, your own control software, in other words, and through a process akin to evolution, uh, you end up with a more intelligent, a more capable robot. Where there's been actually evolution, so the behaviours that are exhibited by the robots, the, the intelligence, has been evolved. But the thing the robot's doing is incredibly simple, like, like just flocking or, or or foraging for, for kind of virtual food. And people look at the robots and say, blimey, is that all they're doing? And you go, ah, well, yes, it's true. It's, they're not doing very much. But you've got to understand that what they're doing is a result of, of thousands of generations of virtual robots evolving. Um, and that the, the process started with nothing. So the robots were unable to do anything at all um, at the beginning of their evolutionary time or their evolutionary process. So yes, you know, it, it, sometimes it is frustrating because the, the end result of this learning or, or evolution, which is a different kind of learning, can appear to be rather trivial. I think the, t the term awareness in robotics is, is tricky. I think it's not clearly understood, or at least different people have a, have a different understanding. Most robots have some, some level of awareness of themselves. So even, even the, the simplest robots, for instance, will have an internal battery monitor 
so that if their battery is running out, the robot will have a little, if you like, interrupt or, or a, a little software flag in the robot's control system will say, battery's running out. Now, of course, the, the programmer may well program some behaviour uh, like the robot going back to its battery charging station in response to that. So that is a minimal level of awareness. That, that's certainly true. So awareness in that simple sense is quite common, I think, in, in robots. And in fact, not just robots, but, but machinery. So, you know, your, you know our, our, our washing machines are aware of the level of the water inside, you know, the, the washing machine. Um, and I think that's an appropriate use of the word aware. So it's the, se the word self that things get complicated. And, I mean, you, you know, if you're being really picky, you could argue that, that, that any awareness of something inside you, i.e. Your, your battery level or the level of the water, if you're a washing machine, is self-awareness. But I would say that's not a meaningful use of the term self-aware. It's, it's rather trivial. Um, so self-aware, I think, to most people means... Um, self-aware uh, in, in the sense that we were referring to earlier when we talked about thinking. So self-aware uh, really means to me and I think to the community of robotics interested in self-awareness uh, being able to uh, step back from what you're doing and reflect on what you're doing. Now your question was, was about internal models. The, the point is that, that unless you have an internal model of yourself, then you have no machinery, you have no cognitive mechanism for, as it were, stepping back in, in some sense. But of course even having an internal model doesn't make you self-aware. I mean, let, let me make that very clear. I'm not, I'm not arguing at all that any robot that has an internal model of itself is self-aware. But what I would argue is that an internal model is probably a starting point towards self-awareness. I think how you achieve self-awareness, even with an internal model, is a huge open research question. So I'd, I'd only go so far as to saying I think it's, it's a great starting point. Consciousness researchers they can't agree what consciousness is, but let's not you know, elaborate too much there, uh, although it's very interesting. Psychology gives us some models, but, the, but they're rather loose models. So, so psychologists argue for theory of mind. So, and I think it's it's I think it's a good argument. You know, they the, the, so theory of mind um, is uh, it's the mechanism. It's it's supposed supposed as the mechanism which allows humans to form beliefs about each other's intentions. So theory of mind is essentially um, what enables us to be social animals, and. Um, again, psychologists and, and, uh, and uh, zoologists agree that we're not the only animals with theory of mind. So, uh, chimpanzee. Uh, chimpanzees have a very well-developed social intelligence. Um, sometimes it's called Machiavellian intelligence. In other words, the, you know, the idea that, that a chimpanzee will will be friends with, with that guy, not because he particularly wants to be friends with that guy, but, but he really wants to be friends with, with her, and he's already friends with her, so, you know, the chimpanzee will employ really quite a sophisticated kind of Machiavellian social intelligence uh, in order to manipulate social relationships. Now that, um, psychologists uh, believe, um, and, and cognitive scientists needs a process that they call theory of mind. Now, we don't know really how theory of mind works, so, so it, it's, theory of mind is a theory, you know, hence the name theory of mind. Um, and there are all sorts of ideas about how 
theory of mind might work. But the one that I find most compelling, naturally, uh, because it gives you a handle on building it, is called the simulation theory of mind. So the simulation of theory of mind uh, argues that in order to, to have a theory of mind, you need to have a, a, a model in your brain, in your head, in your mind, of um, you and your social network. So in particular, you know, your, your friends, your family, your, you know, the social group that, that you're in. And you need to have a model um, <coughs> of, of all of the, you know, the individuals, the conspecifics that, that, that you're interacting with in order that you can make predictions and, and, and you know, have beliefs about, you know, how, how will that guy react if I, if I get angry? Well, you know, in order to, to be able to do that, you need um, theory of mind. So I think, although I would, I would argue that it's not a biological model, um, it, it's really a model from psychology, I think that's probably, uh, for me at least, the, the most useful um, model or, or, or theory um, for thinking about how to build self-aware and ultimately uh, conscious robots. Intelligence is not one thing that you or I or animals, uh, or robots for that matter, have more or less of. Um, and to make any kind of meaningful comparison, I think it's helpful to subdivide or categorize um, intelligence so that you have a more finessed view um, of, of or model, if you like, for intelligence. But the really tricky thing is finding a model uh, that would apply equally to animals, including humans, robots, or aliens for that matter. So a kind of pan-species model of intelligence, I think, is really difficult. So uh, the, 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 the idea that I, I came up, uh, up with a, a year or so ago uh, in thinking about this question, how intelligent are intelligent robots, um, is to think about four kinds of intelligence, or four categories of intelligence. Morphological intelligence, swarm intelligence, individual intelligence, and social intelligence. So let me explain briefly what, what they are. The names I've given um, are pretty much existing names. So I've, you know, I haven't invented these, um, uh, but it, it's just a way of thinking about them, as it were, together and comparing and contrasting these kinds of intelligence. So let's start with morphological intelligence. It's the intelligence that you get from having a body. So roboticists you know, typically use the word morphology. Uh, when they're referring to the physical uh, shape and structure and design of a robot. Uh, and of course, all animals, including humans, have bodies. Uh, and more or less, we have quite a, a, a high degree of intelligence as a result of, of, of those bodies. So our bodies allow us to, to, to react and, and, and do things like walking and jumping and, and picking things up and, and, uh, and eating and all kinds of stuff that you simply couldn't do if you didn't have the right kind of body. And particularly if you look at, uh, at insects, for instance, uh, that have, well, at least compared with humans, rather simpler nervous systems, a good deal of, of the intelligence required, for instance, to walk or run comes from the physical morphology, you know, the arrangement of legs and muscles and so on, the springiness of those or the stiffness of those. So that's morphological intelligence. In evolutionary terms, morphological intelligence is the, the first, I would argue, kind of intelligence to emerge. If animals don't have any morphological intelligence, they're not going to last very long, I, I don't think. Another important thing about morphological intelligence is that you don't need to design all of that intelligence in, in a robot uh, in, in software. So actually, some of the more interesting robots in the world have a high degree of morphological intelligence simply by virtue of their physical and mechanical design. 
the design of their legs or their wheels or their tracks or their wings if they're flying robots. So morphological intelligence is something that you, that you achieve by both physical design, the mechanics, the materials, the motors and so on, combined with some, often a lot, but, but sometimes rather little, software engineering. So it's the way that, that social insects can um, self-organize to build astonishing uh, nests or colonies or termite mounds in the case of termites. The extraordinary thing about, about those structures, those nests or termite mounds, is that they are an emergent property of the thousands, millions of, of microscopic interactions between the individual insects or, or ants or termites. Yet we know that no single animal, insect, has a plan for the whole structure. There's no brain termite, as it were, uh, directing the actions of all of the, you know, the hundreds of thousands of termites in, 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 in the nest uh, in order to, to achieve the, this fabulous architecture with air conditioning and, and, you know, gardens and nurseries and so on. So that's what we call swarm intelligence. So it's the intelligence of the collective where individuals don't have to be particularly smart. But evolution has invented, if you like, um, an extraordinary set of, of, of interactions, microscopic interactions, that give rise in the superorganism, uh, the colony, if you like, uh, to this kind of intelligence. Sometimes it's called the intelligence of the hive or hive intelligence. But I think it's a distinct kind of intelligence. So the third kind of intelligence is individual intelligence. This is perhaps the easiest one to describe. Uh, it's the intelligence uh, that you need in order to be able to, to work something out from first principles. So, uh, so if, for instance, uh, you needed to learn uh, how to make fire and no one's shown you before, uh, then uh, if you're smart enough, you can figure it out. And, and, and that's individual intelligence. Uh, so it's the, um, it's the intelligence that many animals have to be able to, to, to learn something for themselves in their own lifetime. The final kind of intelligence, and I think the, the most recent to have evolved, um, is social intelligence. So this is the kind of intelligence that allows individuals to learn socially from each other. So for instance, if, if I want to learn uh, how to play the piano, uh, then I have a piano teacher, and the piano teacher shows me how to play the piano. And that's social learning. And, it, and, and that kind of intelligence, I think, is, is usefully called social intelligence. Um, of course, you could arguably um, figure out how to play the piano on your own, with individual intelligence. So typically, you know, social learning is kind of mixed in a bit with, with indiv individual learning. Uh, but I think the important thing is that social learning, uh, that the distinguishing um, uh, uh, feature of social learning is that it's learning that's passed, or, it, yeah, it's learning that's passed from one individual to another. And it could be by demonstration, it could be uh, using language, uh, it could be by writing down a recipe, so, so you know, uh, you give me your recipe for chicken soup, and, and, and that's another form of, of, of social intelligence. But I really want to make the point that these four kinds of intelligences that I've just outlined are just an abstraction. In nature and evolution, um, I don't think intelligence comes in neatly categorized modules in, in that fashion. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's a model that might be useful uh, in comparing both animals and robots because it's easier to think about animals and robots having more or less of each of those four kinds of intelligence. So that, I 
suggest might give us a, a better handle on making that comparison and therefore answering the question, how intelligent is your intelligent robot? The problem is, uh, in, in talking about humans, that culture gets in the way. So a vast amount of, of, the, of the stuff you've just mentioned, the motivations, the drives, the, you know, the sense of, of uh, you know, the, the reasons that we get up in the morning and that we, we, we reason, the reasons that we choose to do some things and not others, uh, are culturally driven. If you were to strip away the whole of human culture, uh, then I think you'd, you'd have a very different set of motivations. And I'm sure that the motivations that, that, that we had um, or our ancestors had a few hundred thousand years ago were very different to the motivations that, that we have now. Of course, they'd be right at the, as it were, the, uh, the bottom of, of uh, Maslow's hierarchy. So I think not very useful. In my view, w when we're thinking about robots and, and how to motivate robots, I think it's much better to look at animals rather than, than, than humans. So, uh, you know, pre cultural um, species. Uh, and it's certainly true that in, in biology, for instance, in zoology, um, there are now you know, pretty interesting models trying to express uh, how and why it is that, that animals are motivated at a particular moment during the day or, or, or in their lives uh, to, um, to choose one action over another action. Uh, and clearly those motivations have to be uh, somewhere in the, in the cognitive processes uh, of, of the nervous system of, of, of the animal. And even relatively simple animals have a multiplicity of needs. And those needs are, are sometimes going to, going to conflict or, or sometimes you know, there, there will be a choice uh, in a sense, even though the animal may not be consciously aware of making that choice. So I think that, that we need to look to zoology rather than human culture uh, for models of, of how to build motivation uh, or something that looks like motivation in robots. And machine consciousness is controversial. I mean, it's only very recently that it was even considered to be a, a proper thing to be studying. Uh, so, uh, you know, there haven't been very many grants awarded for people to do uh, work in, in machine consciousness. And I think that it's probably true that a significant number of roboticists think it's a waste of time. The reason I don't think it's a waste of time and, uh, is, is that, that I, I'm interested in robots not just because of, of their utility, not because I think that, you know, they're useful and, and valuable, potentially valuable machines uh, to uh, humanity, uh, be but because robots at the same time are hugely interesting working models. So they're working models for, for, for intelligence, potentially, bits of intelligence. They're working models of life. They're working models of evolution, even working models of culture. So for me, the value of thinking about robot intelligence is not so much to build robot intelligence, but to actually understand animal intelligence. So I think it's the modeling uh, which is the thing that motivates me and others like me who are interested in, in uh, intelligent robots. In robotics, there's a long list of challenges from robot intelligence, which, which is mostly what we've been talking about, so for me, one of the huge challenges is, is how to build artificial theory of mind. But let's put that aside for a second. There are a whole set of, of challenges in robotics which are much more kind of down to earth and pressing. Uh, one is energy. How can robots consume less energy? How can robots be energetically self-sufficient? So we have, for instance, a, 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 an amazing set of projects in our lab um, on robots that can get energy from eating food. Robots that have literally an artificial digestive system. That's pretty cool. Another big problem in robotics is materials. So at the moment, most robots are made out of hard materials, metals and plastics. Uh, but future robots need to be soft. 
So I think an incredibly important area of robotics and a big challenge is, is what's called soft robotics. That ties in with another huge challenge, which is safety. So particularly robots that interact with, with humans have to be safe. Uh, one of the ways of making robots safe is to make them soft, compliant, uh, and light. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if, if a robot um, grabs you, um, it's much less likely to harm you if it's a soft, light, light, compliant robot than a traditional kind of metal, stiff, strong kind of robot, uh, like the ones in, in factories. Uh, so materials, soft robotics are huge challenges. Um, gosh, I could go on. Um, there are enormous challenges in, in providing robots with, with a much richer set of senses and sensors um, uh, than we have at present. So, so most current day robots are hugely, massively deficient in terms of, of, of their sensing of themselves and their environment compared with even the simplest animal. Now, even, even single-celled organisms have a richer set of sensors than, than most uh, robots around today. So sensing is a huge problem. And that brings all sorts of additional problems like sensor fusion, like how do you uh, make use of, of, of a massive amount of, potentially massive amount of sense data uh, in, your, in your cognitive processes in order to, you know, in other words, how do you intelligently use all of that sense data? Um, gosh, um, where are we going next? Uh, I've mentioned materials and sensors. Um, hum human robot interaction is another big challenge. How do we design robots that can interact meaningfully and safely with humans? Um, how, can we, how do we make robots that can understand uh, human gestures, uh, human uh, actions and reactions? Um, if we can't do those things, then the dream, if you like, of, of having robot companions will, you know, simply will not be realized. So robotics is, is full of, of, of immense challenges, and, I, and I'm sure I've missed some of them in, in what I just outlined. Um, it's, in a way, it's kind of humbling um, because in robotics, robotics is, is, a, is a science, is a technology that's only just beginning. Uh, there's far more to, to discover and in, invent than has been invented so far in robotics. And of course, you know, when we look to nature and biology, uh, we're even more humbled, you know, by, by what we find. We, you know, it, it, there's, it really makes you understand uh, just how far we have to go to, 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 to build, you know, smarter, more useful, more intelligent robots. In the field of robotics, I think uh, there are a number of new or emerging areas of robotics, which I think are incredibly important in the future. Uh, and they are, um, in no particular order, uh, evolutionary robotics, which is essentially all about how to evolve robots. Uh, so far, um, we, we, we've learned a little bit about how to evolve robot controllers, but the next big leap will be into evolving whole bodies, whole robot bodies, evolve, evolve the body as well as the, the, the brain, if you like, of the robot. So that's evolutionary robotics. Uh, I've talked a lot about robots with internal models, and I think that almost merits a, a kind of field of its own. So let's call it the study of robots with internal models. Another area uh, that, again, I've touched on is now called social robotics, and that, that covers the whole area of, of uh, robot, robot interaction, uh, human robot interaction, uh, how robots can, can learn socially. And the fourth one that comes to mind is developmental robotics. Again, this is extraordinarily new and, and interesting. So developmental robotics is the study of how robots can develop 
in their lifetimes. So, in other words, we, you know, we tend to have the this uh, view that that a, a robot, you 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 take it out of its box, and there it is. You know, it, it, it's it's fully formed. Uh, it it can do everything it needs to do uh, from from the moment of of leaving the factory. But future robots will almost certainly not be like that. Um, when they're built, they'll be like infants. They'll be they'll be infant bots. Uh, of course, they may not grow physically. That's highly unlikely. But certainly. Um, in, in an artificial sense, they will have to intellectually develop. So that's the field of developmental robotics. Thank you.